morning, everybody. It's Lisa Salberg. It's Friday. We definitely need a Friday. This is Tales from the Heart, which is a podcast brought to you by the Hypotrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. And today, my co-host is Dr. Harry Lever from the Cleveland Clinic. And our topic today is going to be HCM, the newly diagnosed, and those with new or exacerbated symptoms. Good morning, Dr. Lever, and thanks for joining us again. Good morning. So before we get started today, I do have a couple of announcements. Number one, the summit, the HCM summit is coming up and registration is now open. You can register through the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association website or directly at hcmsummit.org. It's a wonderful event. It happens typically every three years, sometimes every four years with, you know, pandemics and such altering our schedule. But it is a fantastic opportunity to hear the latest research in HCM from a very large uh, faculty that has pretty much the who's who of HCM in it. So we hope that you'll join us for that. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors of Tales from the Heart, which include Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, Cytokinetics, Boston Scientific, and Invitae. Uh, We do appreciate their contributions to ensuring that programs like this can continue to educate, inform, and inspire our HCM community. So that being said, Dr. Lever, a couple of times in your career, I'm sure you were faced with somebody who was newly diagnosed. What are your first best pieces of advice to give to somebody who is newly diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, I think the first thing is we need an, we need an accurate echocardiogram to make sure of the anatomy. But, but first, of course, is taking the history and, and making sure that things sort of fit. Some people come in and they've been told that they have asthma, when in reality, it's not asthma at all. And they come in with bronchodilators and things like that, that that should not be given to people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy unless they really do have asthma in addition to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the, the first best step then is to ensure your diagnosis is appropriate and that you're not on any medications that might be contraindicated. That's okay. right. So then, then we, of course, we take an electrocardiogram and we look to see what it looks like. Uh, sometimes people have normal electrocardiograms. Sometimes people have uh, the electrocardiogram of classic left ventricular hypertrophy or thickening of the heart muscle. You also want to check the rhythm to make sure they're not in uh, what's called atrial fibrillation, which is a rapid irregular beating of the heart that emanates from the, the atrium. So once having that, and then we do, a, we do an echocardiogram to make sure that uh, the diagnosis is correct. And we sometimes, you know, the, the, where the hypertrophy is located can vary. Sometimes it's classically in the septum. Sometimes we see a problem with the mitral valve and the septum. Sometimes we see a problem just with the mitral valve. And so we need to know we need to know all the anatomy. Once that's done, uh, then we proceed with a uh, stress echocardiogram to make sure what your exercise tolerance is. There's some people that come to see me and say they feel awful and we put them on the treadmill and they do surprisingly okay. There are other people that come in and say they're just fine and we put them on a treadmill and they can't last more than two minutes and that means that they're really in trouble. So it's very important that we know when we see the patient where they stand. Uh, what what is what what are they able to do? And that's uh, you know so that that's really th- those three things: the the echo, the electrocardiogram, and the stress echocardiogram are really quite important. Go ahead. So let's say somebody is diagnosed at their community hospital or by a community doctor. And they are told they have HCM and that um, you know, they might be given some lifestyle advice. They might be told something that is maybe a little outdated. They might be right on target, um, but it's really hard to tell what goes on in the community. And it's also really hard to see what the truth is on that echo because technique is different and numbers that we find important in HCM 
sometimes aren't collected well at a community level. So if somebody was diagnosed in a smaller hospital or in a doctor's office with not a big specialty in HCM, should they get evaluated or have a medical review of their chart by a specialist or a specialty center? So if they can get there, should they get there? Should they do a telemedicine visit to reevaluate? What should they do if they're not well, sure? I, I think that right now, because of COVID, I might get the record sent to the center that you might be going to see and let it be looked at because, you know, uh, right now uh, the, this disease is seeming to, to go, is increasing. To COVID. Yes. And so what we, what we need, I, I think it doesn't hurt that you can do a virtual visit. You can look at the electro, the echocardiogram and the electrocardiogram and see what it looks like. If the patient, on the other hand, is having very severe symptoms, particularly if they have symptoms of like they feel like they're going to pass out, they need to get to the uh, um, they need to get to the, uh, the the center of excellence to be seen. Um, if you know if the symptoms are very mild, it could be managed for a while without being seen. But I think that if you're having severe problems, you got to get there in the safest way you can. Okay, so I will. For, for the purposes of podcasting and perpetuity, we are filming this on August 27th, 2021, where we are currently in a time where the Delta variant of COVID-19 is surging throughout the country. And we're back on, you know, high alert in, in many ways that we need to really be focusing both on our cardiac health as well as our virus risk. Um, so we'll make some closing comments about COVID at the end of this discussion. So just so people understand what timeline we're in, and hopefully we're going we're gonna to listen to this in a couple of years and think, wow, those were really wacky days we lived through. Um, but for today, um, we'll, we'll take COVID out of the equation for a little bit. So if you're newly diagnosed and you've had your echo, and then you've had a stress echocardiogram, what exactly is it that they're looking for in the stress echocardiogram? We're looking to see, first of all, what your exercise tolerance is. How far can you go on a treadmill? You know, is it one minute, two minutes, or ten minutes? Uh, and and um, uh, and what does your heart rate do when you do that? Uh, makes you know what? And we need to know what medicine you're on. If uh, if you're not on uh, uh, much medication, uh, maybe we'll we'll need to increase that or change the change it. But but we need to know where you stand in terms of your exercise. But also equally important, you want to know what your blood pressure does with that exercise test. Does the blood pressure uh, go up, go down, or stay flat? That's that's a problem. If it if it's flat or it goes down, that's a that, that's that's a sign that there's a that there's really a hemodynamic problem. And then we want to look at what is your pressure gradient. When you exercise, does it go up? Does it, or or does it just stay? Doesn't you know? You don't have a gradient at all. That's important to know that. Um, and there are patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The diagnosis is suspected. They start out at rest with no gradient, and they get what we call a provocable gradient, so that the gradient goes up with exercise. That's important to know. About one third of patients have resting obstruction, a third have provocable obstruction, and about a third have no obstruction, even with exercise. Okay, so we've evaluated the echo. We've done a stress echo. We have some data from that. What's the role of cardiac MRI for a newly diagnosed person? Well, we... we for the baseline, we always do a cardiac MRI. It gives us a good picture of the location of the hypertrophy. It gives us, in addition to that, we can look at the papillary muscles. Those are the muscles that attach to the mitral valve to anchor them in the heart. And sometimes they can be misaligned or they can be, uh, they, they can be of the wrong size or, or, or uh, things like that. And it, you know, it shows us how these, the, the mitral valve is attached inside of the heart. We've learned over the years that it's very important to know about the attachments 
of the mitral valve because that helps us decide how we're going to go on and manage the patient, particularly if, if we feel the patient needs to have heart surgery. But it's very important to know that, that anatomy and how things are aligned in there. So that's, that, that, not only that, but when we look at the MRI, we look to see how much scar is in the muscle. That's probably one of the most important things that we look for because scarring correlates with arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias. And if we see that there's a lot of scarring, then we're gonna be really watching the patient to see what kind of rhythm disturbances they have. Because if there's a lot of scarring, you may be prone to having what we call ventricular tachycardia, which is a rapid beating of the lower chambers of the heart, which can lead to patients passing out, or in the rare case, some patients uh, having sudden death. So we need to know what that anatomy looks like in terms of the scar pattern. And that's, that's we've come to understand that everybody with a new diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy needs to have an MRI scan. Okay, so okay. Now, my audio is really loud today and I don't know why to fix that. Um, so now we have EKG, echocardiogram, stress echocardiogram, MRI. There's one more test that we need to do early on to evaluate risk, and that's a halter or an event monitor. So a wearable EKG that monitors you 24 hours a day for hopefully a couple of days in a row, or if we need to for a month, a 30-day monitor. So once somebody has worn this, what information can you get from a halter or an event monitor? Well, we, we, we can see what your, what your heart rate is when you're doing your normal daily routines. You know, when you walk a flight of stairs or you out walking the street, wh what is that? What's the heart rate? We can see if you're having episodes of what I talked about before, atrial fibrillation or ventricular arrhythmias, which may just be occasionally skip beats or short runs of ventricular tachycardia, or even ventricular tachycardia. The other thing that I've started to recommend for patients, and I must tell you, I have no stock in Apple, but is an Apple Watch. Apple Watch is helpful because you're wearing that all the time. And if you feel some skipping of your rhythm, you hit the button on the thing, and it'll record a 30-second um, rhythm. And that 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 can be helpful. Uh, and you can email that rhythm to your doctor, which can be really helpful. The other thing is um, there's a, another device that you can use your iPhone, uh, your iPhone for, uh, and it, um, it, it will record your rhythm for up to about three minutes. Now, the disadvantage of that is you gotta be sitting down somewhere so that, uh, uh, that you can, uh, record the rhythm. The Apple Watch is nice because it is, it's right there uh, uh, and you just hit the button. The other one, the name is, I'm blocking on it. It's Cardia. It used to be um, Cardia Mobile. Is yeah, it, Cardia is Mobile. Yeah. But there's another one that they've come up with the, um, it's the one that's the, um, oh boy, just block it on the name. Um, we'll, we'll look it up and we'll yeah, put it yeah, up later. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have the Fitbit. Yeah, yeah, the Fitbit one, the Fitbit, that's so it. The Fitbit one is October 1st, they're releasing the EKG right. on this one. Um, I bought it just because I wanted it for for the EKG because um, I'm not an Apple person. Um, okay, Apple people, don't be hating on me. I'm a droid girl. But um, the Fitbit uh, works for me really well. I've been using it for many years. And now this new technology will be available in a couple of weeks on the sense. So I have the technology. They just haven't gotten the app approved yet. So that is helpful um, to wear at home, but like long-term, that's what we're talking about. But in this newly diagnosed phase, staying here for just a minute, this information is now going to be synthesized and we're going to look at what the echo shows, where the hypertrophy is, how bad the hypertrophy is. A little hypertrophy doesn't have the same risk as a lot of hypertrophy. So that's a risk factor. So we start looking at what we call sudden cardiac arrest risk factors, and we make sure with all of these tests that these have been evaluated and your risk can be discussed in what's called shared 
decision making with your physician. They can tell you there are no high-risk features or there is a mild high-risk feature or there are multiple high-risk features. And from that, you can make a decision if an implantable defibrillator is warranted or not, correct? But one, one thing to say though, is you don't want somebody telling you you need a defibrillator until you've had that MRI scan. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's getting to the point now where the MRIs can be done with a defibrillator in place but you do not want to have that done until we know the accurate determination of the anatomy and what the scar pattern is. Because, because we have had patients come to see us who have had defibrillators put in who probably did not need them. The di they were put in only because they had the disease, not because they had a lot of scar or they had uh, you know, a ventricular tachycardia. And we've had people even pass out they didn't pass out from a rhythm disturbance. They passed out behind because they had a high gradient and they got a defibrillator and they were still passing out with that defibrillator that shouldn't have been put in. So it's a very important that that MRI really be done. Uh, I, I work with many people who get deviced up very early in the process. And I say, why? Why did they give you a device? Well, because I have HCM. Okay, that's not a, that's, HCM isn't the risk factor. It's the starting of asking what additional risk factors do you have? Well, we don't know 100% of them. And even to this day, people with zero risk factors can still have an arrhythmia. We know that. And it's an unfortunate, sad reality that we live in. And we're looking for more and more clues to help identify those who are at high risk in a, in a most effective fashion. But we know a lot of them. High risk is kind of easy to tell. Moderate risk is easy to tell. Low risk sometimes is a little bit harder because some of these numbers are a little arbitrary. You know, 4% risk of sudden death over four years is considered mild to moderate. Four to 6% is considered intermediate. 6% or more is considered high. So these have individual meanings as well. 4% to you over a four year period or five year period may seem too high and your risk tolerance isn't there. So that's a discussion you have with your physician if there's a factor to be noted. Zero risk factors, risk benefit ratio, um, devices are not, they're, they're not uh, timid little things. They have complication rates. Um, so that's why everybody doesn't just get one because they, they have risk too. Um, so we've assessed your HCM and you're now in decision-making mode because you need to start some medications probably, you need to maybe make some lifestyle modifications, you need to maybe get a device put in, and there's a learning process. This is where a number of the services of the HCMA can come in very handy. We have online discussion groups where you can talk to peers about what you're thinking and feeling. We have our center of excellence programming where you can go to a high volume program to get evaluated. And we have a phone support system where you can call in, do an intake, spend some time with me on the phone or one of my staff members to help navigate what's next, understand what questions to ask and get actively involved in your care so that you can kind of put it in order and hopefully move on with the rest of your life and check back in with it on occasion and not live every moment for every palpitation. We want you to get on there and live your life and, and be happy with it. HCM is not a death sentence. Um, Harry, can we talk a little bit about prognosis with well-managed HCM? What can people think to expect? I think you can feel that if you're properly managed, you can have a long life. It's not, this is not a death sentence. And it's just a matter of being, uh, you know, having the right diagnosis being and being treated in the right way with the right medications and, and uh, have surgery if you need it or, and or have a defibrillator if you need it. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes the patient needs a pacemaker, but not a defibrillator. And it just depends on all the, the you know, if, if for instance, you have what we call right bundle branch block when you go to have surgery, uh, it's clear that the, the heart has two bundles, the right bundle and the left bundle. If you already have a blockage of the right bundle and you have to have surgery, the left bundle is going to be removed. At that point, you need 
a permanent pacemaker. It, but that becomes really important to know, you know what your risk is in, in terms of needing a defibrillator because we can put a defibrillator which will also pace the heart and shock the heart if it's necessary. So all this has to be worked out and, and you know, so you have an idea of what's going on. But uh, HCM is not a death sentence. It can be well managed. In, in this day and age, it's, that is not a problem. So we have some yes. things coming down the pipe. Um, so the FDA is currently looking at a new medication called Mavic Hampton. It may have some utility in HCM. Well, we believe that it will have some utility in HCM, but it's not yet approved. Um, we don't know how effective it's going to be in all of the different anatomies related to HCM, but there is good data to say that those with obstruction may have a new tool in the toolbox and they may have something to try. Um, the challenge is, my dear friends, are going to be access and availability and pricing. Um, and your insurance company's uptake of new data, new information, new technology, new therapies. Um, it's not going, if it's approved by the FDA, it's not experimental. But whether or not your insurance is going to cover it or not, it's going to take some time to fill this, figure this out. Um, I have been in communication with BMS and there will be patient assistance programs set up. Um, so that if this is approved, we can hopefully get people. The BMS is Bristol, Bristol Myers Web. Right. Yeah, it's a long name. It's kind of like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy association. I just say HCMA. So BMS is Bristol Myers Web. Um, the manufacturers they they purchased myocardia about a year ago, and um, they're bringing the product to launch. So there's um, there's a lot of efforts going on behind the scenes and. We're at the table banging our fists and making sure that patients get access and that um, we do this safely and effectively and patient selection is going to be critical as to who should be getting this earlier on in, in the process. And as we learn more, there'll be more studies and, and the group may grow as to who might be um, able to have a benefit from this. So we're learning a lot. There's another clinical trial from Cytokinetics right now in a similar myosin inhibitor a uh, new drug class. Um, so there's going to be options. We're going to be launching another clinical trial with a company called Imbria for the non-obstructed groups. So what exists today for the newly diagnosed is a world that I could only have dreamt about in the 90s and the 80s when I was diagnosed, actually. But in the 90s, things evolved a little bit. But in the past four or five years, we've made some really big strides to new therapies and deeper understanding. What do you think the future is going to look like in the newly diagnosed phase? More tools in the toolbox early on? Yeah, I think, I think we'll probably be seeing uh, hopefully more drugs and, um, you know, and I, and again, uh, we also want to be aware of the drugs that are already out there and be sure that the ones you're taking are of good quality, which well, has been a problem. Uh, the, the, the only truly authorized generic that's on the market now is metoprolol succinate and it's being sold by a new American therapeutics and it's now getting out there and yeah. we're it's it's that will not be a problem but you want to be careful that there are certain manufacturers again you don't want to take particularly the ones coming from India and but this one out there is the original Mentoprolol succinate and will not be giving people a problem. So we're here advocating for good quality drugs, new drugs, new things so that the newly diagnosed have an easier path than those of us who went before them. So we're, we're, we're beating down the pathway. So it's a little smoother for the next generation. So let's pivot the conversation for a few minutes to Okay, so the newly diagnosed, we've, we've gotten them all set up. Hopefully they've got their intake call and their navigation call with the HCMA. They've got an appointment with the Center of Excellence or, <clears throat> excuse me, a virtual consult with the center to confirm diagnosis and set a treatment plan. And we engage them in the process and, and they're off. Um, so that's part one. But let's say you're diagnosed for 10 years, 12 years, and all of a sudden you're noticing 
stairs are getting more difficult or I'm feeling more palpitations or I'm not feeling right. Do we kind of hit the reset button and go back to the beginning and reevaluate from kind of the newly diagnosed perspective? What's changed? Yep. We, this is when you have to you, you basically start from scratch and you take another uh, uh, echocardiogram and you want to see if the anatomy has changed. You want to see if there are rhythm disturbances. Let's suppose you suddenly are having episodes of atrial fibrillation and you want to, we got to make that, we got to see if that's there. Um, the, we know that and this is where we're a little weak in terms of long-term looking at patients because over the years, you know, we've seen patients at one point in time, but how many patients have I seen over the period of 20 years, having seen them 20 years ago and now seeing them? Not very many. And, you know, we've not seen many patients where the muscle we could say has really increased over time in terms of thickness. I've seen a few, but not many because you know, it, 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 time is, you know, it's, it just doesn't, we don't have over a period of time, we don't have a lot of patients that we followed, you know, for 20 years, that just doesn't happen. But I've seen a few where the muscle, one, one case in particular was a, somebody who was gene positive at the age of 15 and their echo was, naked, was normal, nothing. 10 years later, they had severe thickening of the muscle just like a new case that I had never seen before, but it was somebody I had. And classically, if we're gonna see thickening of the muscle, it's usually gonna occur during puberty where we really see that thickening. But once in a while, it happens when the patient is older. So we really wanna know, has that anatomy changed? The other thing is, it's really important, uh, and this hasn't been worked out, there aren't good data yet, but, probably the patient ought to be followed with an MRI, even the one that's not having symptoms, every three, four, five years. We don't have real good data about how often, but that one MRI over the time may not be enough. And so another MRI can be helpful. But the kind of patient that I really worry about is somebody who has had obstruction and now has developed what we call atrial fibrillation that rapid irregular beating of the heart. The question is, what do you do about that when you see the atrial fibrillation? Well, I've come to believe, and this is my belief, this is not absolute you know, data that's hard yet, but if you're starting to have atrial fibrillation, that means something has changed in your heart and we don't want that to persist. And it turns out the drugs are okay but I wouldn't fool around too long with different drugs trying to get it back and keep it in a regular rhythm. If you're having atrial fibrillation, more than a few episodes, then we have ways that we can surgically correct that. It's called a maze procedure where incisions are made in the upper chambers of the heart. And if you catch it early, you have a reasonable chance of getting that and keeping it back in a regular rhythm. We don't wanna let it go for a long time because that atrial fibrillation puts a strain on the heart and we want to stop it in its tracks and not let it go too long. Uh, we don't want that left atrium to get too big because it, once you get atrial fibrillation, the upper chambers can start to enlarge and then it becomes even harder to control it, even with surgery. So you, you want to catch it as early as you can. And <clears throat> if they're patients without full obstruction um, and uh, they, they have, uh, you know, they start with atrial fibrillation. We're, we're going to probably operate on them, get rid of the pressure gradient in the heart and also get rid of the atrial fibrillation. Got it. So other than um, just to pop in for a second on AFib, um, beyond me is that's, that's for those who are already going to be going through surgery. What about uh, catheter-based ablation for atrial fibrillation and HCM? What do we well, do? again, it depends. It depends. If you have no obstruction, then I, you could use a catheter and, and uh, try to ablate it. But if you have obstruction, you probably should operate and take care of both because the ablation will not take care of the obstruction and the obstruction 
can cause can put more pressure on the heart and lead to the atrial fibrillation. So you're you're if you don't if you don't get rid of the obstruction, the the procedure for the atrial fibrillation will probably fail over time. And that's why if you have both obstruction and atrial fibrillation, I would that would push me to doing surgery quicker. Okay. So I want to take a step back into what I would consider my own playbook and how I best understand my HCM journey and how I try to help other people understand theirs. This all starts not with how we feel or how we think we feel because we think we know what normal is, but we really don't have a clue what normal is because the engine that we were given is abnormal. So we only know how to work with an abnormal engine. So understanding what we feel is important. To me, it's more important to understand the physiology. What is wrong in my heart? Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? What are the potential consequences of that? And what are the therapies that I can do to mitigate the damage? And sometimes in my, I lived with HCM for 36 years. Um, I don't have it anymore for those who don't know, because I've had a heart transplant, but we're going to go back to my HCM days. And the first thing I really needed to understand was volume and fluid and how dehydration was the enemy and understanding how much water in a day I really needed to drink to keep that as, at a balance without falling to the other side of it where I was holding fluid and showing heart failure symptoms. And over my life, these moments ebbed and flowed. And there was periods of time that things were pretty quiet and fine cardiac wise. And other times things would flare up. Why is it particularly important for patients with HCM to understand their anatomy and physiology? Because you, you want to know if you have like provocable obstruction, you really have to remain well hydrated. So the worst kind of weather for you is when it's 90 degrees outside and it's very hot. You really want to not go outside too much in the real heat, but if you do, you got to really drink. And I've often told people that the best place for some hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients is probably Alaska. And they, because it's colder and you don't have the extreme heat problems. Uh, Winter, winter in general is probably pretty good for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. And, you know, li living in Florida is a bad, a bad idea for lots of reasons now. But at any rate, uh, the, 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 the heat is very bad for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. And, and drinking, drinking is very important. That's fluids. That's not drinking whiskey. Whiskey is also very bad for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients because it can cause atrial fibrillation. So you do not wanna be drinking alcohol. I tell patients with this disease to stay away from whiskey, wine, or beer. A bottle of beer, that is 12 ounces of beer, is a shot and a half of whiskey. That's a lot of whiskey. So you don't wanna be drinking. And that's, you know. So we're, we're going to stay with the, the do's, not the don'ts for a moment. So hydration is critically important. And certain medications are important to help the heart relax and to help the heart contract more effectively. So if somebody tries a particular drug and they don't like it, they don't like the way it makes them feel, should they give up on all drugs or should they try no. something else in the toolbox? No, there, there are other drugs that we can use. And um, we usually start with beta blockers. And then we go to a calcium channel blocker. The one that I'm tending to use more these days is diltiazem. A verapamil is older, it's been around for a while, but it's had some issues with being made overseas in India. And you gotta be very careful about that. For a time, we were only able to get one manufacturer of the verapamil. Now I think there's another one that's come out, but I, but you just, you know, but that's the, that, that's, that's something else to change, to try. And then there's a third drug called uh, disapyramide or Norpace, which decreases the force of contraction for the heart and can make some people feel better. The problem is it does cause a dry mouth. 
And in men, it can cause urinary retention because of the prostate gland. So you've got to be very careful when, when you take that. But that is something else that can be tried. And then maybe, hopefully within the year, we'll have this Mevacamptin that we'll, we'll try. But, I, but we also have to understand that we've got to be careful with new things that come out. Because no matter what kind of testing has been done before the drug hits the market, they're all things that can happen that we didn't test in enough patients. So, you know, it may be that Mavacamptin will be patient, will give to patients who have obstruction or provocable obstruction and may not be given to non obstructive That's just something we're gonna to have to find out over time. So, you know, it's, it's a new possibility, but we just have to not be, you know, just jump off the wagon and take it just because it comes out. The other thing, that we have to be careful with that drug is, is that, is that uh, we're gonna need more echocardiograms for a while to assess the patient over time. So that, that's another issue in terms of having, to, having more echocardiograms till we get a better feel for how the drug works. So caution and optimism right. is acceptable at this time, but right. this, there is no magic bullet coming. There is no magic drug for everybody yet. Right. Um, and I use the word yet very cautiously these days, um, but much more liberally than I have in the past, because there's so many cool things coming. Technology is catching up with us. So, so stay tuned. Um, I'm going to pivot to some questions. And I think, so. oh, Carolyn must've come into the office. I, I was alone in the office. Now there's somebody here. Okay. So Let's go to some of the questions that are in here. Um, shoveling with HCM is not fun. So the snow thing may not be great for HCM, but the cooler temperatures are probably better. Right. Oh, I hear you there. Um, so Susan, I'm gonna ask you to contact the office to discuss this in detail, but we'll give some general comments here. So if a young person is diagnosed with HCM and we're gonna, we're gonna be somewhat specific here because there's a couple of nuances that I, I want to explain why HCM is complicated with this answer. Um, a 15 year old boy diagnosed with HCM and massive hypertrophy with a septal measurement of 3.7. And the question posed is, well, shouldn't he, he's not obstructed, but shouldn't he have a myectomy? And yes, he's getting an ICD. So do we utilize surgery for mass hypertrophy? Yes or no? Not unless there truly is obstruction. We, we, it's rare that we would do that. It, 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 uh, not ordinarily not. There have been a few patients, on the other hand, that have mid-cavitary obliteration. It's, we, it's hard, we call, maybe, maybe obstruction, maybe not obstruction, but if they really have bad mid-cavitary uh, um, you know, squeeze, we've operated on a few of those patients, but not many, but we have operated on a few of them and we, to give them more volume in their heart and they have felt better. But that clearly should be seen by somebody who does a lot of surgery. We, that's not something you wanna go to it does 25 operations a year. You want to you want to see a surgeon who has a lot of experience with that. Okay, so we don't do surgery for non-obstructed, except for very limited, and then, and then you're still cavity obliteration may be viewed as obstruction. Um, but in a young boy, I'm going to open this up to the role of genetic testing, which we really didn't talk about today. Um, and a 15 year old boy with massive hypertrophy. I would first be asking for some genetic tests because there are some diseases that look like HCM on echo, but have a different genetic basis and have different life consequences because of that. Um, the one disease I'm thinking about in a teenage boy that I'd want to rule out, and you probably will because it's ultra rare, and that's Dannon's disease. Gannon's disease actually has an, an enzyme therapy or a genetic therapy now um, for that condition. Uh, for some of these young men, there, there is a clinical trial right now. Um, but you want to know what, why is there a genetic mutation that can be identified? 
in a case like that. And genetic testing is critically important to understand underlying disease and what else might be going on in the family. So if, if I had a 15 year old boy who was diagnosed with massive hypertrophy, I'd be asking for genetic testing and an ICD. So um, grandma Susan, call us, get mom on the line as well with us and we'll have a nice long conversation and we'll help understand all of the, the, the language involved here and all of the options. Um, Kat, my, the day my son had a life sentence cardiac arrest, it was a record setting heat day in Denver. So her son survived an arrest, I hope. Um, and it was during extreme heat. I've always found it interesting that you would see clusters of sudden death in young athletes and 40% of those are HCM deaths. They would happen in the late summer, early fall um, during back to school practices. So a little out of condition, a little heat, not good for HCM hearts. Okay. So I'm, my questions are not filtering through properly. So I have to kind of go back and forth. I apologize. Um, Dr. Lever, what else should patients who have new symptoms know? Should they keep a log? Should they look for triggers? Should they? Yeah, I think, I think they ought to look, look to see what's setting off their symptoms. I think that's important. And, you know, and just keep, keep a record. I don't not go crazy, but keep a record of when, you, when you're noticing things. And, you know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't get, let it t get, I, I, we don't have to be writing down everything every minute, but we, you know, have some idea of when things are happening. So first, Kat, my condolences, Kat's son did not survive his cardiac arrest. We're very sorry to hear that. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, additionally, let me, let me pivot to the, the note thing. Sorry, Kat, you got me, got me upset there. So sorry. Um, so writing things down, keeping notes on things. I'm going to be an advocate for that because I maybe didn't pay as close of attention as I should have to some of my own symptoms. And what we've done here at the HCMA is we've created a new tool. It should be arriving in a, about a week or so here in the office. So we'll do a, a whole presentation on this. It's a simple thing. We've created a new My HCM Journal where you can keep your medical records, where you can keep all your important contact information, your, your medication as it ebbs and flows and changes over life, as well as if you notice a new trigger, a place to keep your notes, a keep, place to keep all of your HCM thoughts in one place. So when you go to the doctor, you can bring your book with you and have a conversation about all of the things that happened since the last time, not the thing that you happen to remember at the moment of the appointment. So hopefully we can assist you in getting yourselves a little bit more organized in that sense so that we can get to the heart of the matter, pun intended. Okay, a couple of other points. Are PVCs dangerous? Um, single, one, single PVCs are probably not dangerous. It's when they occur in groups, but you know, more than three or four at a time, then we get more worried. But if they're single, intermittent, intermittent no. So you're going to typically see on an HCM halter, a lot of PVCs. So the number might be high. Don't worry so much about the number. It's, it's how close they are together. And when they start piling on in runs, that's where you have a problem. We feel PVCs very clearly with HCM. It's that the thunk and you wonder what just happened. Um, so they generally aren't dangerous, but we want to worry about them in, in groups. What does having a grade four heart murmur mean in HCM? It, it can mean that there's severe obstruction to the blood flow out of the heart. It can also mean that there's a leakage of the mitral valve. And you have to know how to listen to the heart with a stethoscope and try to sort that out. And of course, the echocardiogram will tell you whether there is obstruction leakage of the mitral valve or both. Wonderful. Um, so understanding obstruction is important in that case. So I would be asking the doctor, what is my gradient? Um, you typically, if you have a harsh murmur with HCM, you're obstructed. I, I can't think of a situation where I've heard of somebody with a really 
harsh murmur with HCM that wasn't obstructed. Although they could have a bad leak. They could have a leaky valve, but the sound tends to be different. Um, and there's actually been some interesting work done on the um, heart sounds. Uh, it's a topic Doug Zipes has been very passionate about for years. He's a cardiologist, electrophysiologist in Indiana. But uh, I know he's been working with the ACC on uh, a, a educational program called Heart Sounds for years. But there's new AI technology that is being used to help uh, interpret those heart sounds. HCMA actually participated in some of that early uh, science back in the early 2000s. Um, so it's nice that it's starting to come to market with some new technology. So that's cool. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions here. I'm flipping back through one more time. Oh, um, you mentioned problems with metropolol. Does this also um, hold true for metropolol tartrate or is it just the succinate? It's probably more so with the succinate because it's harder to make, but you just gotta, you gotta be careful with any drug you're taking today because they're coming from foreign countries that aren't doing a good job. So I would, I would watch the tartrate also. And if you're, and if you're, you know, certainly if the symptoms aren't being controlled, you want to know what the pharmacy gave you. Because what most people don't realize is when a physician writes the prescription, uh, the pharmacy gives them what they have in stock. And most physicians are not specifying manufacturers. And, and sometimes the pharmacy will change the manufacturer and not tell the physician. They just put whatever they get in stock that day is what they hand out. They assume that it's all the same, but it's not. Okay. We're going to spend the last five minutes here talking about COVID-19 and vaccinations. So we do have a question. This is a good question. Um, it gets into the weeds a little bit, but John, we're going to try. Um, he is between his first and second vaccine. Um, first dose was Moderna. He's concerned that myocarditis is a possible risk of the vaccination and he wants to know if there's a need for taking antibiotics between my dental visit because it's between the first and second vaccine. So we've got a couple of questions here. I'm going to unpack this, John. Number one, Dr. Lever, do you believe that patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should pre-medicate before dental work if they are not allergic to antibiotics? Absolutely. I've been doing that for years and we feel very strongly about that. The last thing you want to get is, is uh, endocarditis uh, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That can uh, push you into having emergency surgery. So you do not want to know about that. So full disclosure, Lisa had endocarditis in 1990. It literally almost killed me. Um, so the guidelines are a little bit weird in this area. There's been a push back to using premedication because the argument is they don't see a lot of endocarditis anymore. And my argument is we don't see a lot of endocarditis because we use preventative antibiotics right. and that's why we don't see it. So why should we stop doing the thing that stopped the bad thing from happening? If you're not allergic. Uh, I, I do it. Well, I'm a transplant now, so it's a little different. So yes, you should premedicate for endocarditis with those of you who have obstruction. If you're truly not obstructed, there might be a reason not to, but if you have any obstruction at all, that turbulent blood flow creates the perfect breeding ground for bacteria, which is what caused me to have a stroke. So take it seriously. So that's the premedication question. The secondary question is there, the risks of myocarditis with the vaccine, are those risks less than equal to or greater than getting myocarditis on top of COVID? It's, it's less, less with the vaccine. And, and to be quite honest, right now, there's a lot of people, we're not really sure about a lot of this stuff. I probably would stick with the same manufacturer that you had for the first shot. And if you've you know, you've got to follow it for the Moderna. I believe it's like two or three weeks, you get the second shot. I would get that. If it's that long you, that you had it, go get the vaccine. Don't fool around. We, uh, one of the problems that we're starting to face is um, that there's breakthrough with the vaccine. So you do not want to let 
it go on to, you want to be fully vaccinated as best you can so that you don't get the disease. Do not waste time, you, but you got to follow the guidelines of what they recommended when you got the initial stuff. So if it's, you've had it for more than two to three weeks, I guess we should get the vaccine. The next question comes up is getting the booster. And um, there's, now they're saying eight, they said the other, literally the other day or the other week, it's gonna be eight months. Then there's something that hit the news yesterday or the day before, they're saying it may be six months. So um, we're gonna have to watch that very closely. But as soon as you can get the third shot, if you've already had the two, get it. I'm and getting the booster probably today, if not yes, today, don't, tomorrow. Don't, don't fool around with this. This thing is, is very bad. And I would tell everybody that they should continue to wear a mask when they're around people inside, for sure. And if you're in a crowd on the outside, absolutely. You've got to wear a mask. And now what they're recommending is the N95 mask, not just the paper mask or the surgical mask. They're recommending the N95 mask. This, for indoor. This, no? For indoor. Yeah, for indoor. This is very significant. And if you're, you know, if you're out walking the street and there's not many people around, you don't need a mask. But if you're indoors anywhere, absolutely wear a mask. There was just an article in our local newspaper today that they think that we're going to be seeing a, a big, bigger spurge here in the or surge in this in this disease. And they're really telling people, wear a mask. Okay, closing comment, Harry. Um, we've been getting into some, or some people have been attempting to get into conversations related to vaccine risk. And it's highly troubling to me that the same people who will go to an emergency room in time of crisis and expect technology to save them are reticent to utilize technology that has been proven and that has been used in hundreds of millions of people now worldwide um, to get this vaccine. To the people in this community with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or living with somebody with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, do you believe they should all receive the vaccination. There is absolutely no question about that. Everybody in this country, unless you have some weird allergy to vaccines, should get the vaccine. It is, we are seeing a horrible spike in the disease right now. And it's because people are not taking the vaccine. They are making the breakthroughs more common because there are more people out there with the disease because people haven't been getting the vaccinations as they should be. There is this, 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 this vaccine is something that works. It may not last as long as we'd like it, but it certainly works. It has saved a lot of people's lives and there is absolutely no question you should get it and you should not fear getting it. It will not kill you. It will save your life. As a matter of fact, if you don't get the vaccine, there's a good chance you will die. I can't be any stronger than that about it. You, if you don't get the vaccine, your chances of dying are high because the incidence has really gone up. So follow up, flu season's coming. Should they get the flu vaccine? Absolutely. Okay. And, and I would also say that, uh, that you should probably try to get the strongest dose of the flu vaccine that you should, that's usually given to older people because that'll really protect you. We want everybody to be vaccinated. We want everybody to stay safe. We want everybody to have an opportunity to have a healthy future with their HCM. So we all gotta get out there and do what needs to be done. Um, again, I remind you that Summit 7 registration is now open and you can go to 4hcm.org and register. And Dr. Lever, thank you 
for joining us today. As always, sorry about the wonky start. My computer freaked out on me. We'll edit that out. Um, have a great day and uh, join us for the Big Hearted Warrior Tour on September 9th. UPMC will be the featured program. And I am thrilled to be able to have um, both Dr. Timothy Wong, who's the uh, director of their HCM program, and a longtime friend of mine, Dr. Mark Estes, formerly from Tufts, now at UPMC, will be with us to have a discussion about uh, implantable defibrillators. And that's kind of a special conversation because he literally put my very first ICD in. So it'll be fun revisiting those lovely days of ICD implant. So join us on September 9th. You can register now uh, at 4hcm.org. Thanks, Dr. Lever, for joining us. And thank you all for joining us on Facebook Live. And we will address any other questions after the live event in the um, Q&A below. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Tales from the Heart. For more information on HCM, we encourage you to visit our website at 4hcm.org. Join us online for the conversation on our Facebook page or in our private group. Facebook page can be found at Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. And our Instagram handle is at 4HCM Warriors. That's the number 4HCM Warriors. Follow us on Twitter at 4HCM.org. For those members of the LinkedIn community, you may want to follow the conversation on the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association group. Join us today. To contact the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association, you can call 973-983-7429. You can email us at support at 4hcm.org or visit us online at our website 4hcm.org and send us an email from there. The Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association is located in New Jersey and operates on East Coast time. We would like to thank our sponsors, Myocardia, Invitae, Boston Scientific, and Cytokinetics for their support of this program. The HCMA is partnering with Myocardia, 23andMe, and others to help learn more about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Learn more about these initiatives at 4hcm.org. Invitae, a genetic testing company and a sponsor of Tales from the Heart, is proud to provide free genetic testing to families with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Please learn more at 4hcm.org. Hey, we know life with HCM can be challenging, and support is critical. That's why the HCMA has created an online support group system to help you and your loved ones live better with HCM. Join us. The HCMA is seeking volunteers on a number of different projects, including our online support group system, our peer-to-peer, big-hearted friend system, and our legislative subcommittee. Please visit 4hcm.org to learn more today.